And we're live. Hi, everybody. I hope y'all have had a wonderful week this week, and I'm so happy to see y'all again, especially since last time I had some technical difficulties. So as people join, I'll explain what happened and why it's not going to happen again. But if you're just joining, you should have the 2020 Mary Ruth with you today. This is a white wine blend, and I know we all love it. This is a staple white wine of ours. So open it and get some in a glass. As you're joining, um, I, I'm going to be happy to see everyone this week because I didn't get to explain my technical difficulties last week, and I'm so sorry that that happened. Um, everything shut down my internet for um, three hours. It was a long time. Um, and I just, I couldn't do anything to get it back up. So I'm, I'm so sorry that that happened. We have a Stelvin enclosure today. And I know I've said this before many a time. Uh, if you have a Stelvin enclosure or a screw cap, this is a signal to you that this is meant to be drunk at its freshest. You don't need to age this. You can hold it for a year, sometimes maybe more. But what it's doing is it's uh, preventing oxygen from getting to the wine and it's sealing in all the aromatic intensity, all the fruit, all the flesh, fresh flowers, so that when you get into the glass, it should be an explosion. It should be fresh. It should be vibrant. There's no need to age this wine. We want you to drink it super fast and then get more. So get some in the glass. This is meant to be easy drinking. And while we will um, talk more about it and break it down um, as far as how complex it is, um, I recommend this at uh, 45 to 50 degrees. So chilled, not too cold because it will dull the aromatic intensity. I want this to still be lively. Um, but this is meant to be just an easy drinking day. Um, where we're going to talk a lot, drink a lot, but we're not going to really assess the wine today. This Stelvin enclosure tells you chill and drink right away. All right, we have most everybody joined. Tell me where you're calling from. Thanks for your comments. Awesome. Hi, Ray and Michelle. Hi, Sherry. Melanie uh, and Sherry, how, how old is your uh, Mary Ruth? Have you been aging it for a while? Hi, Kelly. Welcome back. Eric and Asia in San Antonio, like me. So um, I'm so sorry for the technical dif difficulties last week. Um, it was on my end, not on y'all's, and it's not going to happen again. I lost internet for about three hours. I could not do anything to let y'all know what had happened. So I'm happy we got through most of the episode, but we are going to kind of roll in what we talked about last week into this week, and it's just going to be kind of a continuation of last week. Hi, Christopher. <laughs> sorry for the... Uh, technical difficulties. Oh, Sherry, 2019, that's not too old to be drinking. You're going to still have that freshness. This screw cap is going to do its work. If you have a 2015 Mary Ruth, it might not be as fresh as you'd want it to be, but it still wouldn't be bad. And I've said this before, if you open your wine and it's in your fridge for five days, that wine has not gone bad. If you've overaged a wine, Wine ages like this. It's like a roller coaster. You try and catch your wines at their peak. Most of us are drinking the, the wines here. We drink them when they're young. Um, and I think the statistic that I've seen before is that 80% uh, of wine is drunk within the first, uh, like, it's, it's like 75 minutes of being purchased. This is because people want to buy their wine and drink it immediately. We don't age most of our wines. So for instance, this Tanat from High Estate, the peak of this Tanat may be 10 years from now, but most likely I'm, I'm going to drink this in two weeks. I'm going to be drinking it when it's here. When a wine has been overaged, it just means that it's gone through its journey. We're at 10 years and then it's kind of fallen off. If your wine has fallen off a little bit, it doesn't go from here down to here immediately. It just kind of tips off and it slowly starts to decline. So you are you can still be drinking a wine that's um, been open for a little while or over aged. You're still going to catch it here. The goal is, of course, to catch it at its peak. That's when everything is in balance and it's harmonious. But most of us aren't drinking our wines that way. That can be a goal for your nicer wines, your best wines. Your 2019 Mary Ruth is probably right here. <laughs> 
it doesn't mean it's bad. It means that it's just not the poppiest, freshest. But also the 2019 had a little bit more acidity than this year, and that actually holds it for longer. So that was a long way of saying, Sherry, don't even be bothered that you have an older version of Mary Ruth. Uh, but my recommendation for the 2020 Mary Ruth is drink it all and buy some more. Drink it fast. Hi, Brian and Vonda. Welcome back. Welcome back, everybody. Awesome. If you're just joining, open your Mary Ruth, get some in the glass, and let's just toast to Mary Ruth. Um, and I'll tell you the, the story that I know y'all already know. Um, first, cheers to another week. Cheers to technical difficulties, but being able to get online a week later and still reconnect. That is delicious. My wine is a little bit too cold. And I know that because this screw cap tells me that this should be kind of an explosion in the glass. And it's not right now. It's uh, it's a little bit dulled. So I'm going to let this warm up in the glass. And I kind of like to cut my hands around here so that it can warm up a little bit more. But again, this is personal preference. If you like this wine warm, drink it warm. If you like it with ice chips in it, do that. If you like it super, super cold, do that. It'll be better for you. So... Mary Ruth, we all know Mary Ruth Blackman. Um, she was Bill Blackman's mother. She passed away in 2011. So it was about 10 years ago. So William Chris Vineyards had already opened. She was actually one of the investors that supported Bill and Chris's vision. Um, she poured wine for a couple of years here before she passed away. But she was a fantastic artist um, and she did pastel. She was actually part of a, a pastel um, kind of collaboration and she did work in uh, Texas and New Mexico. I think it's called the Pastel Cooperative Club or something. So she was part of um, a, a, a group that supported pastel paintings. Um, we have her artwork, of course, represented on site. Um, our beautiful 1905 farmhouse has a room that's dedicated to Mary Ruth and her artwork because she was such a big part of um, of making William Chris what it was, um, raising Bill as an artist. She was overall a humble person, a teacher, um, and very generous, um, especially when it came to supporting the William Chris Vineyard uh, vision. So Bill planted his first vineyard for her in 1983. Um, he was meant to go to school, study agriculture, and then become a cotton farmer like his father. That would have been, he would have been the fifth generation cotton farmer. Uh, but instead he went to school and found out how awesome grapes are doing in Texas. And he um, went home, was supported by Mary Ruth to um, plant some grapevines. So he dedicated his first vineyard to her. Unfortunately, it uh, froze over in the early 1990s. Um, we know Texas High Plains has a huge issue with freeze. And so um, the vineyard was destroyed. At that time, they moved to the Texas Hill Country and Bill started planting um, grape uh, vineyards in the Texas Hill Country and experimenting in that area. Um, but from the moment Bill said that he wanted to plant grape vines, Mary Ruth was in support, um, so much so that that first vineyard was, was hers. She was a big lover of white wines, which is why our flagship white wine is named after her. Um, it was when uh, they moved to the Texas Hill Country that Mary Ruth kind of split her time between New Mexico and Texas because her pastel artwork had um, kind of gained so much favor um, in two different states, which is awesome. And of course, we all know that artist blend uh, that we drank last week, her artwork graces some of the earlier vintages of the uh, of the uh, Artist Blend series, um, and those are sold out, so you cannot own those anymore. But we do have prints of hers for sale on site, so you can come in and take some of uh, Mary Ruth's artwork home. So cheers to Mary Ruth. I saw some comments popping in here. I want to see if y'all had any questions before we go on. Yeah, we make this Mary Ruth every single year, and uh, Asia brings up a good point. The 2020 vintage is one of her favorites, but it is different year to year. Um, we change what we do. We adjust to each vintage, knowing that if you have a recipe for your wine and there is huge amount of vintage change, the wine is going to change regardless, and we want to give you the most vibrant, fresh expression um, that changes year to year. Awesome. Yes, Jennifer, you are right. She was on the first Artist Blend wine bottle that was in 2010. 
And then she was on uh, the second and fourth, I think, as well. Um, and then Bill slipped some of his artwork in there. Um, who knows if she was still alive today, what the art artist blend would look like. It may have still been opened up to the community uh, to submit artwork, but it did all start with, um, with her beautiful artwork. All right. Dottie, yes, let's, uh, let's enjoy wine and talk more about it. So you may notice that I have something in my wine. This is tarragon. Um, and I want to talk to y'all about, I'm sorry, I have to stop myself. I lied. That was just to entice, entice you to keep watching so you can learn more. Um, the new Summer Sippin' uh, series pack is available. Um, and so I wanted to tell y'all that I, I want to get these out of my way just because there's not a lot of room here. Um, these are the next four bottles. We are continuing with Summer Sippin' all the way through September. I think we have six plus more episodes planned for you. So we are starting with San Giovese from uh, Alta Loma Vineyards, um, Lost Straw Cellars and William Chris Vineyards get all of the fruit from Alta Loma, and this is an award-winning vineyard. Um, I am so excited to share this with you. Sangiovese is one of the three major grapes that William Chris is dedicated to showing you more of because it does so well in Texas. And I think Sangiovese was a really surprising choice for Texas. And we'll talk about why that is uh, next week. Then we're going on to the Grenache Rosé. And remember when we were drinking the Artist Blend and I said it came, all the grapes came from Vintage Press Vineyards. And Christopher, it was you that asked how um, the makeup of a vineyard, what grapes are planted, decides what will go into that blend. Well, if we didn't want to use all of the Grenache for that Artist Blend, we can reserve some to make a rosé. If we didn't want to make all of that to not blend it into the artist blend, we can make a single vineyard to not without the rest of the blend. So some of your vintage press Grenache grapes went into the artist blend and some of them went into this beautiful bottle. So you can snag this in that pack. We're going to kind of break down what this Grenache added to that artist blend. Then, and I had to finagle to get this in the pack for y'all. 2017 Tanat from High State. I'm so excited. So we have drank Merved. We have drank a uh, Grenache, a red Grenache. Um, last week's Artist Blend also had uh, Syrah and Tanat in it. So we can break down Tanat um, and talk about what it adds to a blend when it's blended in, in week three of this next period. And finally, we had the Roussan in week two. This is Marsan. So Roussan and Marsan are often blended together in the Rhone Valley of France, often with Viognier. We pull those out of the blend and make them shine by themselves. So you'll be able to see what the personality of Marsan is in the fourth week here. And I am so excited to get to this one. It's, it's so good and so different than the Roussan. And I, I really appreciate that. So when you get this summer sip and pack, you are going to get a discounted rate for all four of those bottles, like you do every four periods. Um, but you'll also pay for shipping. So that you don't pay for shipping, add two more bottles. And I have two to recommend for you. Um, and I can write these in the comments a little bit later if you can't remember and you want to. I recommend that the week we get to the Marsan, you also have a Roussan ready for you. There is still a case special on that. It's not on the website, so if you like the case special, it's 12 bottles of the Roussan for uh, $350. You get shipping included or just pick up a single bottle, add it into your cart with your summer seven packs. You can drink the Marsan and the Roussan together. And the other wine that I'll recommend for you is another bottle of the Artist Blend. Because we all enjoy it so much, you can drink it with that Grenache Rosé or drink it the same week as the Tanat. Have them open side by side because we talk about food and wine pairing a lot, but wine also pairs with wine. If you have two glasses next to each other, and we did this with the Tempranillo from Par Vineyards, we had two Tempranillos next to each other. They help bring out things in each other. So drinking the Tanat next to that artist blend will make the Tanat more apparent and more lively when you're drinking the artist blend. And this is a way to kind of dive further into that artist blend and really start to identify what, what blending wine is like and what it means. Um, so 
get the summer sipping pack. If it's not live right now, it's going to be live at the end of this session and then pick up your Rusan and pick up another artist blend because you know you're going to need more anyway. All right. So I hope everyone's already gotten their packs. And now we can talk about why I have tarragon in my glass. Um, let me just make sure I didn't miss any question. Yeah, Karen says they're not on the website. They're coming up right now, I promise you. And yeah, we all love the 2017 Tanat. And it's coming from our own estate, High Estate. I mean, you know, we pulled up a lot of the grapes on High Estate to plant more Tanat because it just does that well. And you'll be able to see why in uh, the third week. All right. Yeah, Melanie, wine always pairs with wine. It's never <laughs> a bad thing. So um, I have tarragon in my glass. Um, and this is something that I do every once in a while to help me tap into a wine a little bit more. So I know that there are four grapes in the Mary Ruth. When I drink that wine by itself, it's absolutely delicious. I can pick up so much complexity because all of those four grapes are very aromatic and vibrant. And so they're pushing out of the glass. They're fighting to come out of the top here, all these flavor compounds. They're trying to outshine each other. And as the temperature changes, the flavor compounds continue to change and continue to pop out at different rates. So it's always a journey with this wine. With that much complexity, it can be really tough to get at everything. If you identify a couple notes in a wine, but you want to get a little bit further into it, one tactic that you can use um, is to decant. Another tactic is to pull some, pull one of those flavors and drop that item in the glass. So I swore the last time I drank this, and I've never tasted this before or smelled it in this wine, I swore I smelled tarragon or anise, something licorice-like. So I put a little tarragon in my glass today to help me tap into that. This will either taste disjointed and wrong and I'll know, hey, there's no tarragon in that wine. It's just, you know, I was tricking myself or maybe there was tarragon smell wafting through the, from the kitchen into my, you know, um, bar here. If you do smell the tarragon, it's also going to push out other flavor compounds because the flavor compounds are constantly bonding to the oxygen and then unbonding and they're kind of interwoven with each other. So the tarragon dropped in this glass will help me tap into the tarragon flavors in the wine, but also to, it'll open the door to something else. And I don't know what that is. I'll let you know when I figure it out. But right now I can tell you, I did smell tarragon in this wine because this tarragon dropped in here is making this even more lively. And it's giving me a different story than I had last time. Now, I want you guys to tell me, um, what else you're getting in this wine? What else could you drop in this glass? Um, I have done this with peach before and it was absolutely delicious. Um, it it kind of makes me feel like I'm drinking a cocktail, but I'm also learning more about the wine when I do this. So treat this like a cocktail. Um, give, put a little coconut in there, put a sprig of thyme or rosemary. Test this out with any wine. I'm talking like red, rosé, white wine, sparkling wine, and let it help you tap into the wine. This is not cheating. It's just a, another way to have fun with your wine and to kind of give yourself some practice. And this is the only kind of checks and balances that wine has. You know, we can talk about what this wine smells and tastes like all day, but the only way you're going to know for sure whether, whether you know, I do smell tarragon in this wine is if I actually have the tarragon next to me and I check against it. <laughs> and tell me whether this does something for you guys, because it might not. Now, other ideas I have for this wine, and I want you guys to take advantage of the uh, case special on this wine because you can get 12 bottles for a discount like you always can with the Mary Ruth. We want you to be able to have a lot of it. But every time you open it, you'll have an, a different idea for the next wine. I've always smelled coconut in this wine. Um, so I think a fun thing to do would be to get your glass and um, kind of put some of the wine around the rim and put some toasted coconut on one side, just on one side so that when you're drinking the wine, you're smelling the toasted coconut up here. It'll help bring the coconut out of the wine and then you'll probably get something else there too. 
Um, I think peach in this, I think an apricot pit would be really interesting. Tons of herbs. You could have fresh flowers on the table. This is a really complex wine, so you could have you could have a lot of fun with this. Now, one thing I noticed about this wine is it has a ton of fruit, but there's a ton of other stuff too. You know, every time I think about putting something in this wine, it's always herbs or it's always something other. Um, and so if I wanted the fruit to pop out more, what could I do? And I, I said this with the artist blend, if you have a little salty snack, it'll help the, uh, the fruit pop out of the wine. That's what salt does. Um, you could give this wine a salt rim and just have a little like taste of the salt and then sip of the wine. It'll make the wine pop. This is what happens with margaritas. Why would you also do this with wine? I want you guys to have so much more fun with your wine. We food and wine pair like we have a rule book, but there is no rule book. If you want to mix this into a cocktail, do it. Think about what kind of cocktail this would be similar to. And I think automatically of like a French 75, it has a little spritz, it has some elderflower, it has some herbaceous, it has a lemon twist. And then it has gin, which has juniper and herbal things. That is so this wine. You could have so much fun with this wine. And so I want everyone to grab more of this and just experiment with it and have fun because we, we drink Mary Ruth year to year. It changes every single year. We should be able to drink it in so many different ways. And I really encourage you to uh, have fun on Instagram, tag William Chris Vineyards with the next crazy thing you do with the Mary Ruth and tell us all how much fun it was to try something different with this wine you know and love already. I know that y'all have some questions, so I'm going to see what the comments have been like. Kelly's not getting any peach. I encourage you to put a piece of peach in this wine and see whether it comes out then or whether you're right and there's just no peach in that wine. And it may be a uh, white peach instead of yellow peach. It could be peach skin. It could be peach pit. Um, it could come out more when the wine warms up. Never thought. Grapefruit and a little pear. Bra Brian, yeah, that's awesome. Um, I think it's definitely pomaceous, apple, pear, and such. Yeah, Rachel, I think... Uh, I think white peach may be what it is, but if so, it's really underripe white peach. And when you get a white peach and it's not yet ripe, you really can't smell much. It's, it's a, it's more of a flavor. Um, and I don't know how to describe that, but it, it would be very interesting to attest that out. Tell me what y'all think of that salt rim idea. I'm curious. Uh, Naomi, try it as a sangria. Yeah, do it. Throw a ton of fruit in there. Throw some herbs in there also, though, because this is such an herbaceous wine. I think that'll help tie it all together. Um, but as a as a cocktail, I think this could take the place of something like elderflower liqueur, mix some gin in, mix some Mary Ruth in, and give it a little spritz of something on top. It may be ter terrible. It may be terrible. But it's going to be so fun to try that and see how it goes. And I bet you'll discover something really cool along the way. Now, I, uh, I had an idea to try this as a kind of mimosa, but not with juice. Um, because I think... And when I said wine and wine pairs together, I think what would be so cool is our William Chris, Mary Ruth, and our William Chris Pet Nat married together. You treat the Pet Nat as a little bit of juice. It'll give it a pop. It'll help tie in because you're drinking Texas and Texas together. And then you've made a William Chris Vineyards mimosa and um, it's going to be a huge party. <laughs> it's going to be really cool. I think that would be so much fun. And tell me how crazy that idea is. Um, I hope all of y'all are going to go on the website and buy the Mary Ruth now just to try that. Uh, if you need some pet nap and it's not on the website, reach out to me. I can help y'all get everything you need to have some fun at home with Mary Ruth. But my point in talking about all of this crazy stuff is just to, to tell you that we have so much fun making this wine. You should have so much fun drinking it. And I know y'all already do, but we're ready to give you like outside of the bag tricks. We're ready to have like an all out new kind of party with all of our wines. Um, and that's, I think what wine should do for you is make you think outside of the box and, and do some crazy things.
in a really safe, fun way, <laughs> of course. All right, so um, we have opened our Mary Ruth. And we have four grapes in this wine. And they may sound a little strange. They may be grapes that you don't recognize or haven't had before or think you haven't had before, but you probably have in one way or another and just didn't know it. Um, but we're blending from all over Texas. So we've talked about the new legislation. We've talked about what Texas means on a label. If you have Texas ABA on a label, it means that 85 of your grapes must come from Texas and 25% can come from outside of Texas. But of course, we're not doing that. We're blending all Texas grapes in together. And they're coming from really all over the place. They're coming from the Texas High Plains, right around the Texas Hill Country, and then out west towards that desert area going towards New Mexico. We're sourcing from all over here. And really, from what I've seen of the Mary Ruth year to year, that's been kind of the goal. We want to show you what the entirety of Texas tastes like so that when you get in deeper to our wines, you can see what just the Texas High Plains tastes like and then just what a single vineyard in the Texas High Plains tastes like. That's our goal is to give you the large all the way down to the small. So this is the large. This is the whole of Texas. What does this taste like? It's fruity. It's bright aromatic. There's minerality in here. There's a there's a vibrancy in the acidity. You know, it's not very acidic, but it's still poppy. Um, it's complex and it's juicy. The fruit is slightly underripe here. It's not, you know, getting to that really tropical stuff. So maybe this was a, a cooler year. This is what represents Texas for the year 2020. Um, as you get into the smaller single vineyard sites, you get into really, really specific terroir, but that's not what we're talking about today. I wanna talk to you about um, what the interesting grapes in Texas are right now. Um, so in this wine, we have two versions of Muscat, Muscat Canelli and Moscato Giallo. And both of those are in the Muscat family. And we talked about this before. Um, Muscat is a type of grape, but it, it covers a large group of grapes that are actually some of the oldest grapes in the entire world. So Muscat uh, Canelli is another name for a grape called Muscat a Petit Grand. And that means, I'm sorry, that was a really, really terrible um, butchering of that, uh, of that word. It is, in short, it means muscat with little berries. And that's what you get with uh, muscat canelli is really tight clusters with very, very small kind of brown colored grapes. This is often referred to as maybe the oldest grape in the world that was the parent grape of all other grape varieties. But we don't talk about it often. And this is because Muscat um, got a little bit of a bad name. It got associated with a very, very singular type of wine. And that is sweet Moscato. That's a great thing to associate with the Muscat family if you love sweet wines. But those people who don't love sweet wines kind of pegged muscat, the whole muscat family, as a sweet wine grape, which is not so. This is a completely dry wine. We have two forms of muscat in here. And the sweet flavor in Moscato is a winemaking choice to leave sugar in that wine. So when you ferment um, your muscat canelli all the way to dry, it is floral. It's kind of low to medium acidity. It's really, really aromatic, and it has nice warm spice flavors, and it has kind of a musky flavor, and that's something that the muscat family is associated with. So your second type of muscat in this is called muscat giallo. You may notice on the back of your bottle that it says muscat blanc or muscat bianco. Yeah, it says muscat blanc. This is a, uh, a labeling thing. Texas actually does not, re or uh, I think it's the tactic, Tax and Trade Bureau does not recognize Moscato Giallo because it's not grown widely across the U.S. So we must put Muscat Blanc on the label. And that's the closest association to Mus Moscato Giallo. Actually, Muscat Blanc is a parent grape of Muscat Giallo. So this entire family has a lot of different grapes that are similar, but have a little bit of a different character. And from there, all other grape varieties um, were, were made. So Muscat, uh, Moscato Giallo, 
has bigger berries. It has a completely different personality. Um, the berries are yellow, they're not brown. Still have that musky flavor. You still have vibrant aromatics, but you have a little bit higher acidity in that. So you have these two grapes in the same family, able to complement each other in different ways. Then you have Blanc de Bois, which has a little bit higher acidity than both of your Muscats. And we know that this is that hybrid grape that was um, invented in Florida. So this is a completely unique blend because we're using a hybrid grape that really grows largely across Texas, but not really um, much elsewhere. And then finally, we have rounded out this blend with 5% Sauvignon Blanc. And this is the first year that we are working with Sauvignon Blanc. So we have never created anything like this. And this brings me back to a question that uh, someone had last week about how the blend actually comes together. Now, we were drinking the artist blend last week. And I want to talk to you about three different kinds of blends that you can have and how they came together. And that'll kind of tie into why we would do something like this with the Mary Ruth. But I'm going to have a sip of wine first and read y'all's questions if you have any. Sherry, did you put a salt rim on your wine? I'm so happy. That's awesome. So Sherry's saying that the salt rim on the 2019 brings the Muscat Blanc to the palate, and that's your Moscato Giolo. Awesome. Melanie, yes, Muscat um, is a family of grapes. So you have Orange Muscat, Muscat Canelli, uh, Muscatel, you have Moscato Giolo hundreds of grapes in the Moscato family. Um, some of them are red, some of them are kind of pinkish rosé in color, some of them are brownish in color, and some of them are yellow or green in color. So this is just an example of how grapes and grapes have babies and they create something completely new. Awesome, awesome. Oh, Sherry, I'm so glad y'all tried that. And I'm so glad to hear that some of y'all were associating Muscat with sweet wines, but I'm happy to tell you that you don't have to. Um, and I'll tell you a trick on how you can find out whether a wine is sweet or not. But let's talk about blends first and then remind me to come back to that if I forget. And Francisco's uh, loving on the Mary Ruth as well. Everyone say hi to Francisco. He's your best favorite tasting room ambassador at William Chris Vineyards. I know he's probably blushing right now. All right, so we're going to talk about three different kinds of blends because we had a lot of questions last week about how the blends actually come together. We know the stories about these wines, but why were these grapes put together in this glass, in these bottles, in the barrels, in the fermentation tank in the first place? For three major reasons. One is there is a tradition of making certain grapes into blends, and this goes back hundreds to thousands of years. We're looking at regions that have been making wine for a very long time. This is a lot of Europe. This is um, Italy, Spain, and France, um, Germany, Austria, you know, the people who have been making wine for a very, very long time, going back to the Greeks and Romans, the Phoenicians and beyond. There were patterns that emerged with what was called noble grapes. They were highly desirable grapes for their characteristics, complexity of flavor, nice structure, consistency in the vineyard, disease resistance, etc. These grapes were played around with a lot and they found a home in a blend. I want you to think of the Rhone Valley in France. Grenache, Syrah, Merved, and a smattering of other grapes are commonly blended together in the southern uh, Rhone Valley in France. This is the classic blend that's associated with that region, and it goes back hundreds, hundreds, and hundreds of years. So we've taken our artist blend, and we've kind of extended that tra tradition. What we can do with this is add a signature or a little twist, which um, William Chris Vineyards has decided to add a little to not to this. So we are blending these together because there is historical proof that these grapes do well together. A second way that you can decide to blend together is based on structure. 
So you have flavors and flavors that pair to each other. You know, savoriness and nuttiness will always go together. That makes a lot of sense. But when a winemaker is faced with an array of grapes that all have different personalities and they're thinking, what should I blend together? The answer is in the structure. This is heavy tannin with lighter tannin. And maybe that grape that has the heavier tannin has low acidity. So you want to blend it with something that has low tannin, but has a higher acidity. And then maybe this high tannin, low acidity grape over here is very savory, is very like dark fruited. So it makes sense to pick a grape that has high acidity, low tannin, and maybe is very, very fruity. You blend those two together and you test out how much um, each will complement each other. I did a really interesting class with an Oregon winemaker uh, named Maggie Harrison. Um, she, she makes fantastic, fantastic wines. But the way she blends all of her wines together is by blind tasting them. She has all of these wines fermented separately, made into wine, and then she starts to blend together. She tastes them all separately and says, I think this would go well with this and maybe a little smattering of this and maybe this, tastes it and just kind of hedges away from there. It can be a long, grueling process, and what you end up finding is that what you thought went well together caused other things to emerge, and maybe that's desirable or it's not desirable. So you start with assessing the structure and what will complement each other, and then you hedge from there. You find out what works, and you find out what didn't work. You add a little bit of this, you add a little bit of this, and then you kind of scale back when you need to. And that's how our winemakers are blending together. It is a trial and error process. The final way of blending things together is field blending. This is taking whatever you have in a single vineyard, in several vineyards, whatever you have left over in the winery after you've made all of the wines that you make year to year, and just blending it together and seeing what happens. This is not necessarily taking into account structure, flavor, what would go well together. This is um, tossing it up in the air and, um, you know, doing everything that you can to make this wine shine naturally. The best example of this that I can come up with is our pet nat. So many different grapes go into that. This is grapes that we have left over from all the other wines that we make. This is certain grapes that have bright acidity, will be super juicy, that we know will go into making a fantastic pet nat. We crush them all together, we ferment them, we stop the fermentation halfway through, bottle the wine, and let the fermentation continue in bottle for our pet nat so that we don't have any control over what happens in the bottle. We don't control the flavor. We let what Texas tastes like and all those grapes taste like together just be. Turns out delicious year to year. Turns out it's not hard to make beautiful, exquisite Texas grapes taste delicious if you just let them be. And luckily we do have exquisite grapes to start with. So what you get in every bottle of our wine is either intense thought, um, you know, the hedging, the paying attention to structure. It's either based on traditions that we've seen around the world that we are kind of making our own, or it's just based on letting the grapes shine. So there you have three distinct types of blends. And I'm sure that William Chris Vineyard's team does kind of a combination of all of these. For instance, the Mary Ruth, I would say is kind of a, it's probably a mix of two and three. It's probably a mix of looking at these grapes and what would complement, And then also, you know, kind of a field blend. This is a raw expression of Texas. And uh, I would assume the Blanc de Bois and the Sauvignon Blanc in there was to raise the acidity a little bit so that the muscat could be very aromatic, very floral, very fruity, very herbaceous. And then the Sauvignon Blanc and Blanc du Bois kind of raise the acidity so that you have a nice balance. Um, and I will tell you, we talked about co-fermentation last week. Sometimes we co-ferment grapes together and that's what happened with the artist blend. 40% of this blend was co-fermented, which means we put all four of the grapes together in a fermenter and let it fermenter. So we didn't taste those grapes. We didn't taste the finished wine before we blended anything together. Mary Ruth has, um, since Tony Ophill became a part of the winemaking team and is now our head winemaker, he's employed co-fermentation with our white wines. And that's a really special thing because it takes some of the choice out of the process. You know, if the two muscats are co-fermented together, we don't have a choice of, you know, putting more of this one in and less of this one. 
we let uh, kind of the winemaking process do what it wants. Um, and then we add the Blanc de Bois and the Sauvignon Blanc separately, if that makes sense. If you have any questions about that, I know I said a lot of words just now um, and it was a lot. Just ask me to repeat anything and I'll make it nice and concise next time. Um, we had a lot of questions about uh, how blending comes together and there's no real quick answer for that. It really depends and it's, um, Blending is where you get to see a lot of winemaking personality, and it's a really, really special process. And even though our single vineyard, single variety wines are absolutely amazing, sometimes they take more work in the winemaking process or in the wine growing process. Um, blending is where winemakers really get to tie on a signature, and I think they've done that with both the Mary Ruth and the Artist Blend, and I hope you'll agree with that. All right, I saw some comments pop up. I'm going to try and answer any questions. <laughs> awesome. Christopher dropped a peach into his wine, and it made it more fruity, and it mellowed out the acidity. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, do you like it? Was it interesting? Did it bring out any other flavors? Awesome. Karen, um, we are on week eight right now. So this is uh, the halfway point episode of all of our episodes. So the next pack y'all need to get is nine through 12. And if it's not there now, it will be up very soon. Awesome. Yeah. Anybody who's out on site, um, please go talk to Tony. He's so interesting to talk about, especially about the white wines. I love talking to him about wines. He has such a clear vision for them, making them this wine used to be a little bit sweet, apparently, and I wasn't here for that, but Tony had a vision of it being a very dry, very vibrant wine um, that was very gently pressed. I know um, the Mary Ruth goes through a very interesting pressing process. So we usually press your grapes over the course of an hour. Um, Tony has implemented a champagne press and is it's the same press, but the press goes down for about three hours instead. So it very, very slowly crushes the grapes. And that way you get extreme delicacy out of this wine. It prevents um, any loss of those really, really delicate, soft aromatics. Um, so he's really done a lot to preserve all of the intensity in here. <laughs> Awesome. I see I shocked a little people with the, the salt on the rim thing, and I, I dare you to try it. The way I think of it is if you're going to pair food and wine together and the food is going to be salty, why not salt the rim? It's something we do with other drinks. It would be really weird if we didn't salt the rim of other drinks, but you know, wine is, you know, this is a blend of different grapes. It's a cocktail in its own right. It has all of the same flavors that you would achieve by blending a, a cocktail together. Think of tequila being warm and tropical and um, spicy or something like rum doing the same thing. And then into cocktails with rum or tequila, you usually put a little squeeze of citrus. Sauvignon Blanc is citrusy and Muscat is floral and herbaceous. Um, and Blanc de Bois has some warm spice notes. You know, you've made, you've built a margarita in the glass. Um, so why not a salt rim? And I think this wine has a little bit of saltiness to it already. Um, but I will also challenge you to think about, and maybe y'all don't do this. Um, I drink lagers a lot, really, really light, um, light beers. I love to sprinkle a little bit of salt in. And next time you're having a beer, I challenge you to just toss a little salt straight into the beer and taste it. It makes the fruit pop. That's exactly what salt does to food. If you salt a, a sauce that you're making, it makes the richness and the fruit pop out of it. And it does the same thing with wine. So don't think I'm crazy. There's a reason I'm saying these insane things. I want y'all to have fun with this wine. And if it's too weird, don't do it. Enjoy the wine. But I'm going to keep putting things in my wine and testing it out and know that if you put water in the wine, it may break down the flavor compounds, but anything else that's dry, the flavor compounds are going to change as they hit your tongue, especially if you're eating something else or if you brush your teeth or if you had coffee, the flavor compounds are going to start breaking down. So why not in the glass right away? You're just causing wine to do more things in front of you. It's like a magic trick. 
Oh, Kelly, I love that comment. Um, for some reason, I really enjoy pairing this wine with sharp flavors. I like the contrast of the subtlety of the wine with the contrast of sharp cheese or peppery meats. And I think that's awesome because if you notice, this wine doesn't have very high acidity. So something that is very sharp is kind of, it's balancing out this. So when we're talking about blending grapes together to complement each other, when we're food pairing, we're doing almost the same thing. We're picking something that this wine is either missing or we're picking something similar to it so that they complement. It's all complement and contrast. So I love that you said that, Asia. You really picked up on that kind of low acidity in this wine. Um, something acidic next, next to it or something sharp is, it's only going to make it pop. I love that. Bill Fultz is drinking Hunter Merlot. Please share. <laughs> That's awesome. Bill, drink a blend after your Hunter Merlot. That's a really easy fix. Um, Awesome. Alan, I'm going to answer your question, then we'll move on to the next topic before we run out of time. Speaking of blends, what is your favorite WC winemaker's blend between Murderer's Row, Broken Hands, and Ground Control? Oh, can't believe you asked that question because I didn't get to try all of those. Y'all bought all of it before I, I could try any of it. Um, let me see. I think uh, the one that really stood out to me, and this has nothing to do with you know, who's better between Tony, Evan, Bill, and Chris, because you know the winemaker series, each winemaker had kind of choice over what they made. Um, I really enjoyed the uh, Murderer's Row. Uh, I didn't get to try the ground control. I've actually, I don't think I've ever tried Broken Hands either. Um, I tried Tony. I got lucky enough to try Tony's. I mean, it was really, really enjoyable. Um, someone had asked me last week or the week before whether we have any ground control or broken hands, by the way. Sean, Sean, we don't have any more. No, we have none. I'm so sorry. But the great thing is we are still making awesome wine for you. So more is to come. So if you are uh, a member, just wait. More will come. I'll let you know when the coolest things come out. And um, if you're not a member, sign up so that you can be there for when the next, you know, really cool thing is. By the way, the September release, um, Rochelle of the, the wine club, she just sent an email about what the wines were going to be in the September release. And they are mind-blowingly awesome. So if you're not a wine club member, email me so I can sign you up and you can get that September release, hopefully. Uh, because it's going to be ridiculously awesome. You're getting some really cool stuff. All right, so let's talk about the next thing we're gonna talk about. Um, unique grapes growing in Texas. I just wanna talk about, um, we've talked about Muscat Canelli, which is also known as Muscat Appetit Grand. Um, we've talked about Moscato Giallo. We've talked about Blanc du Bois. You know a little bit about all of those and maybe you haven't heard of them before. There are other grapes in Texas that uh, you may not have heard of before. Right now, we're growing 79 different grape varieties, and this number may have changed by the time that, you know, the, the assessment I saw was from 2019, so that may have changed. William Chris works with 24 or 29 grape varieties. We've chosen the ones that we think are doing best in Texas. Since we're at the beginning of our journey, we are in an experimentation phase, and we are looking for what suits Texas best. We're also looking to identify what our flavor is. And I don't just mean William Chris Vineyards. I mean Texas. We are looking to see what fits Texas best, what is best growing in the vineyard, but also what tastes most concentrated and what people will be able to taste and peg as Texas. And if you've seen the documentary Psalm, you've seen what the master sommelier testing is like. What a master sommelier will do in their testing process is something that other sommeliers have tested for and WSET professionals have tested for as well. You get wines in front of you, usually two or three white wines, two or three red wines, and you taste them not knowing what they are. And you have to identify what the grape is. You have to identify um, what the year it was made and you have to identify where it's from. So there is a sense of place to the wines in front of these sommeliers who are testing or wine professionals who are testing. There should eventually be a taste of Texas. A wine professional should be able to sit in front of a flight and pick out what tastes like Texas. The best way to do that is to identify what shows Texas best. And this is why Chris Brundrett has selected uh, Merved as 
um, a grape that really shines with Texas. And we talked about this a couple weeks ago when we drank that Merved 2018 from the Texas High Plains. We talked about how Chris uh, Brundred and Andy Timmons, they talked about what would potentially do well in a Texas vineyard. And Chris said, well, Merved makes a lot of sense because it's growing in Spain. It's really hot there. It's fairly disease resistant. It's frost resistant. That all sounds like what we need in Texas. And they they planted it without really knowing what the reward would be. And the reward, the reward was amazing. I mean, there were phrases that came through and Chris and Andy were still harvesting the Merved grapes that they had planted because they had resisted the freeze when everyone else's grapes had died. This was the first sign that Merved would be great for Texas. But what was surprising was that it it changes its flavor so readily to different vineyards and different regions. It really, really shows not just what Merved tastes like, but what Texas tastes like. And that's why we've identified that as a grape that showcases Texas well. Over time, because we're young, we're in an experimentation, uh, uh, an experimentation phase. Over time, we will slowly identify what makes the most sense for Texas. So while we're working with about 80 varieties in Texas now, over time, we'll narrow that down to 50. We'll narrow that down further to 30. Maybe in 100 years, we'll narrow that down to 18 stellar grapes that make sense for Texas. The rest of them were delicious, but weren't as good as everything else. And this is how wine region becomes a fine wine region. They throw everything that they have behind what is the best, the most exceptional, not just what grows and what they can sell. Um, Think two regions of France, the Rhone Valley we talked about, they've dedicated to Grenache, Syrah, Merved, and a smattering of other grapes. The Northern Rhone has dedicated to Syrah and Viognier. Bordeaux has dedicated to Cabernet Sauvignon, Merlot, Cabernet Franc, Petit Bordeaux, and a smattering of other grapes now because the laws just changed. Burgundy has dedicated to Pinot Noir and Chardonnay. They've thrown everything they can behind what has grown best, and that is where Texas is going long term. So all this experimentation with the Muscat grape varieties, experimentation with Italian grape varieties, not just Sangiovese, but also um, your Alianicos, your Sagrantinos, your Nebbiolo is being planted in Texas now. Um, Primitivo, this is uh, Zinfandel, that is originally an Italian grape. Um, and then your Italian white varieties, this is grapes like Trebbiano, um, these are all what's being planted in Texas as an experiment right now. Um, and this is the time where you're getting to taste and kind of, you're kind of voting when you purchase a bottle of wine. Um, I have put my faith behind this great variety that I think is doing well in Texas and is standing up to um, the rest of the world. Um, you know, over time we'll drop some great varieties that are either too difficult or don't have enough reward. And I'm really, really excited to watch that process. Uh, we are watching history right now. I saw a lot of questions pop up, so I'm going to read y'all's comments. Just pause for a moment. Francisco, yes, we're going to talk about Chiriga Nassia now. I'm so glad you brought that up, um, but I wanted to have a glass of wine and answer questions first. <laughs> yeah, Francisco, the wine that's coming in the September release, that uh, 2019 Sangiovese from Leahy Vineyards. It's a first vintage of um, single vineyard Leahy Sangiovese. That's awesome. I have no idea what it's going to be like. I've had Leahy Grenaches. I've had other Leahy fruit, but I haven't had Sangiovese from Leahy Vineyards. And I'm so excited to see what that's like. Um, Kelly, the documentary is, um, it's called Somm, S-O-M-M. -M. Um, they have three of those now. I've actually only seen the first one, shame on me. I, I need to go watch the rest, but it, it details the master sommelier testing process um, with some actual um, people who tested. Asia, you're taking the specialist of Texas wine course. That's awesome. Um, please tell me how that goes. Our director of education took that test, uh, that took that course a little bit earlier this year. And Bill, I'm talking about Psalm 1. Um, Bill, have you seen all of the Psalm documentaries? And if so, can you recommend which one was your favorite? Um, these are great. It's just kind of an eye into what some wine professionals choose to do with their time. Um, lot, it takes lots of time. Um, I don't want to make it sound easy or, 
it's it's an insane process that I will probably never be able to go through. But we'll see. Maybe. Awesome. Asia, thank you for the love of Texas Zinfandel. I I think that it is it's a really interesting grape in Texas and Zinfandel likes to ripen unevenly. So you get some green berries next to some really, really ripe berries on the same, on the same cluster. Um, but Texas is able to kind of ripen all of those berries so that you don't have any green berries on there. It takes lots of heat, takes lots of warmth. That is some love that Texas is able to give. And I agree our Zinfandel is very unique next to any other Zinfandels. So thanks for that. Awesome. Karen, what info are you looking for? Um, yeah, Karen, tell me a little bit more about what kind of information you're looking for, because I could probably point you in the right way, I hope. Uh, but let me know. Oh, yes, Karen, if it's the Texas, um, the certified uh, Texas wine specialist, it is offered through the um, Texas School of Wine, and that's located in Houston and Austin, and you can do it remotely. Alan, yes, Zinfandel grapes are grown in the, um, yeah, the Hill Country ABA Zinfandel is grown there, but it's mostly in the Texas High Plains, and that's where, um, that's where Paca Vineyards is. That's where we're growing our Zinfandel, and I think we only get Zinfandel from one vineyard right now. It's not very widely planted, but I think... Um, I think there's a lot of promise behind Zinfandel um, because you can make some really cool kind of late harvest Zinfandel wines that have been, they hang on the vine for a little bit longer and they get to be kind of raisinated. And this is how it's done in Italy. You get kind of raisins on the vine and you make them into a really, really juicy, really, really intense kind of raisinated flavor wine. That's absolutely delicious and very food friendly. And I think Texas might be able to do that. So I'm hoping they were going that way, but We'll see because I'm not growing any Zinfandel myself and I'm not making any wine right now. Awesome. Okay, so uh, we need to talk about Tariga Nacional. So we've talked about Italy. There are so many thousands of different grape varieties growing in Italy. And this is because there are 20 different regions in Italy. When, when Italy is split up into wine territory, you have 20 different basically what I call states. Um, Sicily is one, Sardinia is one, Tuscany is one, Piedmont is one. So you have everything split up. And each state, each wine growing region grows totally different grapes, which is why when we talk about Sangiovese, we talk about Chianti, which is in Tuscany. And Tuscany has put their faith behind Sangiovese. But the surrounding regions of the Marche, Umbria, um, you know, all the other surrounding regions, they have not dedicated to Sangiovese. They ha have each picked grapes that make sense for their region. And it's typically associated with the history of the region, but also the food that's, um, the food that's served there. Because, you, you know, each, each region also has different traditional cuisine. And this has to do with who settled that region and who's living there and what the community is like. Um, it's kind of like the languages in Italy. It's, you know, your dialects are very different as you move across Italy. And so is the wine. Um, so Texas is working with a lot of the different hundred thousand plus grapes that are growing in Italy. We've selected some from the kind of mid to southern regions of Italy that make the most sense. This is your Sangiovese. It's your Treviano. It's your... Um, can't think of any other Italian grapes right now. Uh, your Zinfandel, Primitivo, things like that. Um, Nero d'Avolo grows in Sicily. That is an Italian grape. Um, all of these we found success in Texas, but it's not just Italy. We found success with Spanish grapes like uh, Garnacha and Carignana. And then when you go over to Portugal, you have your port grapes. These have traditionally been made into sweet fortified wines. But when you bring them over to Texas and plant them in Texas soil and you make them into a dry wine, they are absolutely stellar because they're able to fully ripen. And these are your grapes like Tinto Fino, which is also known as Tempranillo, and grapes like Tariga Nacional. And if you have not, if you haven't tried a Texas Tariga Nacional before, I really, it's not even a challenge. I, I have to tell you to go find some. Trigonacional is a stellar, beautiful grape, has a ton of structure, 
it's a red wine, right? It's really, really spice driven. It's really herbal and tea like it has leather and tobacco notes. The most similar grape that um, I can give you is Tanat, but it's not even like Tanat. It just has a lot of this, it has a lot of structure and depth. Um, if you like Tanat, you're very likely to like Tariga Nacional. And yes, we work with Tariga Nacional. It sounds like it's not a common household grape, but if you have ever had the fortified dessert wine called Port, you most likely had Tariga Nacional in that wine. And similar to Tariga Nacional, I know you've had some of these little known grapes before hiding in your wine. You've probably had um, Moscato in a dry wine before without knowing that it was a grape in the Muscat family. You've had it before, you just haven't heard of it. So this is where the challenge comes in. Texas is working with grapes like Cabernet Sauvignon, Merlot. We're working with Chenin Blanc, Viognier. They're staple grape varieties that we know of because they're growing across the U.S. and across the world. And they're some of the highest production grapes in the world. They're what we call noble grape varieties. But then there's a smattering of other grapes. And this is your Muscat Canelli, your Muscat Bianco, your Sagrantinos, your Primitivos. These are not forgotten grapes, but underrepresented, underrecognized grapes. They're, you know, when you walk into the grocery store and you see a bunch of words that you don't know, most likely those grapes are hiding in the name somewhere and they just don't stand out to you. Please don't ever think that because you haven't heard of the grape before that you're getting a lower quality wine. You're just getting something that the market hasn't recognized yet. Um, but that does not mean we won't get there. And I want you to think about how much you love the Mary Ruth year to year. This wine has traditionally represented uh, underrecognized grapes like Malvasia Bianca, which we didn't talk about. That is a, an island grape variety that grows in Crete. It grows in the Canary Islands and largely doesn't grow outside of that. There's so much concentration and intensity and reward from growing a grape like that. And it makes sense for Texas. We have a coast. We have salty sea spray from the Gulf. We have a ton of sun. It's exactly what you get on an island, so it makes sense here. So these small islands that are working with grapes like this that you maybe haven't heard of before are absolutely worth the experimentation in Texas. And it's anyone's guess whether they will be left behind or embraced. Um, but it, it kind of takes knowing a little bit more about them and learning about how to appreciate them in order to move forward. There has to be faith on the consumer side that these grapes are worth investing in. Um, so I challenge all of you to go out and get your Tariga Nacional from Texas, get your Malvasia Biancas, go find some orange Muscat and buy it and support those great varieties if you like them and want them to keep being planted in Texas. Because um, we all know that if you don't buy any more, um, you know, Merlot or Tempranillo, it's not going to go away. We're still going to plant Merlot and Tempranillo, but we don't want Malvasia to die out. We don't want orange got to go away and they're doing so well in Texas. And I want you all to see what's happening with those as well. So kind of venture outside the box. And I know it takes a little bit of trust, but with winemakers like Tony O'Phil and wine growers like Chris Brundret and Bill Blackman, you can actually put trust behind the fantastic winemaking team of William Chris but also the fantastic winemaking teams across all of Texas, because Texas is very much a band together uh, type of uh, wine growing state. Um, people planting vineyards in Texas have most likely talked to Bill Blackman and um, people making wine in Texas have probably made wine with Chris Brundrett before. They're all doing it together. Um, and certainly we've had winemakers at William Chris that go on to start their own projects and their wines are well worth investing in and, and going to find as long as you also keep getting some William Chris wines so that it can all be done together. And I want you to experiment and, and go for the things you haven't heard of before. All right, let me see what other, I had a lot of comments pop up. Let's see, any more questions? Asia's talking about apossimento wines. I didn't throw that word out there, but that's exactly what I'm talking about. That raisinated style of Zinfandel is called apossimento style. And they're delicious, aren't they? We do make some of these, but a lot of our red dessert wines are being made of black Spanish, which we talked about last, last week, two weeks ago, when we were talking about hybrid grapes. 
so we um, we just acquired Hoover Valley Vineyards, and Bill is talking about the Montepulciano and Alianico. Those are originally Italian grape varieties that were growing in Texas, and Hoover Valley is making some delicious Montepulciano and Alianico, and I can't wait for you guys to try it, and that's something that's coming next. Kelly, I'm so happy that you've learned so much um, about wine lately, and I've had a lot of questions about whether we're going to continue doing summer sipping even past the summer or going into fall. And the answer is, I don't know. Um, we're devoting time to summer sipping right now, but what would really help is knowing more about what y'all have enjoyed and uh, what y'all want to be seeing next from us, because I, I think our virtual offerings will not end. I mean, it certainly was born out of the COVID-19 crisis, um, but it's something that William Chris Vineyards has really embraced and has been a really special addition to an already fantastic um, program. So if you do enjoy our virtual offerings, whether it was the, the this summer sipping or whether it was the winemakers tastings that um, Catherine and Chris Brundrett did together or uh, the happy hours that Dee used to do, what we'd really like to hear is more about what you'd like to see, what format you're enjoying, uh, what you want to be next, um, so that we can give it to you. Um, the place to send any feedback is, of course, on um, you know Facebook. You can do this through um, Google reviews. It's a five-star review on the Summer Sipping episodes and tell us more about what you'd like to see. But also at uh, info at williamchriswines.com. And this is Catherine Brundrett will, you know, open your feedback and respond to it, take it into account. And uh, we'd love to hear more about what y'all are enjoying and what you think we could be doing more or better. Uh, and that was info at williamchriswines.com if you'd like to give us any feedback. I mean, it doesn't have to be now. We have at least six more episodes of this. So all in good time. We want to know what's next for this. Uh, Lauren, what bottle would I recommend to try of those great varieties? Um, so we have a beautiful Tariga Nacional from Robert Clay Vineyards, and this is in the Texas Hill Country. Um, we make another Tariga Nacional, and I'm going to ask Francisco and Bill or any other William Chris employee to remind me what the other Tariga Nacional we've had is. But the one that stands out in my mind that I had most recently was from Robert Clay Vineyards. And we really, we did um, a Merlot and a Tariga Nacional from them. We really hand selected those two grapes. Um, that also is a really, um, really cool vineyard that does a lot of um, sustainable and biodynamic farming. I know that they have sheep that kind of graze through the vineyards and it's a little bit more of a natural way to, um, tend your vineyard. So they they have a really cool website. Go onto the Robert Clay Vineyards website. But our Trigan Nacional made by them is amazing. And if it's not on our website, shoot me an email. What else did I say? The Zinfandel from Paca Vineyards this is our only Zinfandel. Um, that's the only vineyard that we sourced that from. And it's a 2017 vineyard. It's very light and earthy and it's it's um, still really juicy even though it's light and that's absolutely delicious. Um, we make a Trebbiano from Granite Hills Vineyard. It's um, beautiful. That's a white wine. It's really, really light and silky and sultry. Um, and fun fact, Trebbiano is um, often used for cognac or brandy. And that's the common grape that's used for that. And also for um, a lot of dessert wines as well. What other grapes did I mention? Um, we have... Alianico and Montepulciano from Mandola Vineyard. And uh, we, 2018 was our last vintage of Mandola Vineyard fruit, so we won't make any beyond that. So if you find anything from uh, Mandola Vineyard, snatch it up. We make a field blend of the Mandola Vineyard fruit, and then we do some single variety expressions. And that's fantastic. It's They grow all Italian grape varieties plus Grenache. And that is so cool to have one single vineyard dedicated to fruit that comes originally from one specific region. So they've, they've dedicated to those Italian grape varieties. And I think that's really cool. All right. Jennifer, do we still source grapes from Robert Clay? Um, yeah, I think so. Bill, do you know? 
Um, and Bill's telling me the other tree ganassianel is from Phillips Vineyard, and that should be extremely different because it's coming from the Texas High Plains. Um, Phillips Vineyard has a very particular flavor and aroma profile that I won't tell you about because I want you to uh, experience it for yourself. <laughs> awesome. We have lots of support for the uh, Summer Sippin' Series continuing through the fall. Um, shoot that feedback to info at williamchriswines.com. And if we don't continue this, we're going to do something like it. Don't worry, but I want to hear more about what y'all uh, what y'all want. Um, oh, Jeffrey, I see that you asked what the difference is between the Robert Clay Tariga and the Phillips Tariga is. So I'll tell you a little bit about those two, but I'm going to tie it back to what we learned about the geography of Texas in the first episode. So remember, the Texas Hill Country has lower elevation. It has warm wind that's coming through Mexico through the Texas Hill Country area. So you're getting lots of warm wind and lots more humidity. This may speed up the ripening of the grapes in the Texas Hill Country because they get a little bit more warmth day and night. And then up in the Texas High Plains, you have a raised plateau that's at least 3,500 feet above sea level. That means that as you go up in altitude, you get cooler nights and then the grapes are raised up to the sun. So you get more sun exposure. So what you get in the Texas High Plains because of that, you get cooling wind, of course. You get preserved acidity because of the overnight cool temperatures. And you get higher alcohol because your grapes are closer to the sun. They're ripening, ripening, building up sugar a lot. So you have higher alcohol, potentially preserved acidity. So you have a nice balance of ripe and tart. Then you come to the Texas Hill Country, you have a warmer growing season day and night. So you build up more flavor compounds sometimes, but really just different flavor compounds. All of that warmth is giving you subtle pops of flavor compounds. And I, the experience I have between Texas High Plains and Texas Hill Country wines is your Texas High Plains wines pop and they're vibrant and they're juicy. And your Texas Hill Country wines are sultry and they're complex and they're they're thinker, they're ponderer wines. And I don't know if that gives you an answer at all, um, but I really can't tell you the difference between the two because I haven't had the Trigan Nacional from Phillips Vineyard. I only had the Robert Clay. But I can tell you that with Trigan Nacional, you're going to get less fruit, more of that other stuff, earth, herb, nut, etc. And the difference is going to be maybe high alcohol and uh, tartness. And subtle complexity and um, lower alcohol. I hope that made sense. This is why it's difficult to uh, to tell you what you're going to get from a certain area. You really don't know what you're going to get until you open the wine. It also depends on the year. But generally, it's those conditions that is going to define how the grapes ripen and what they taste like. All right. I'm way over time here. Um, but I love your comments and your questions. I am going to have to come back and uh, answer the rest of these next time. Um, but this is great because it gives you a reason to go buy the next pack. Um, hopefully it's on the website. You're buying series nine through 12 this time. And remember you're getting two red wines, one from our own high estate, a rosé and a white wine. So you have everything you need for the next four weeks. And the cool thing is I'm gonna be in California next week. So the summer sipping episode, going to look a lot different than this next week. It's going to look like whatever house I'm staying in. Um, so we're going to have a fun chat about California versus Texas next week. And I'm hoping to drop off some of that Alta Loma Sangiovese at the wineries that I'm going tasting at so that we'll have some California teens joining us next week. So if you have any friends in California, ship them a bottle, send them a pack and invite them to join as well so we can have a big Texas, California celebration and chat. Um, but I'm excited to see y'all next week. I'm sorry if I didn't get it to any of your burning questions right now. Um, but if I didn't answer anything that you really want to know about, just shoot me an email at KelseyKR at WilliamChrisWines.com and I'm always here for you. Um, if you need any help ordering the pack and adding on exactly what you'd like, just let me know. Um, but otherwise, I'm going to sign off. I'm going to keep drinking my Mary Ruth, and I hope y'all will as well. Go grab some salt, salt your rim, throw some stuff in your wine, and experiment around, and tell me about it the next time we hop on together.
I will see y'all next time. Thanks for being here, guys. I love, I have so much fun with y'all every week. And I think, I hope this never goes on to two hours because I could just talk to y'all for hours and hours, I feel like. Goodbye for now. And I'll see y'all next week in California.